Hey there everyone, how are you today? It's Brian Barron, the Director of Skincare Research for Paula's Choice Skincare. I'm clicking back over to my video screen. I think y'all should be seeing me by now. Yes, yes, it should be switching over. I upgraded, uh, well there was an upgrade, there we go. <clears throat> there was an upgrade to the software that I use to uh, connect with YouTube so that y'all can see me. Um, <laughs> And I was like, okay, just, maybe I shouldn't have chosen like half an hour before the show to, to run this, but I'm glad it worked. So, um, yes, hello again. I'm Brian Barron, uh, Director of Skincare Research for Paula's Choice Skincare. It is Wednesday, February 22nd, and this is the uh, second and final live chat for February 2023. Today's topic is going to be uh, the B vitamins. It was originally going to center more on niacinamide, which is probably the most well-known B vitamin, but in talking with the social media team, I thought, you know, there's a lot of other B vitamins uh, out there. We're gonna go over all of them. Not a super deep dive. Um, I, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about the ones that are um, more, most relevant to skin in terms of um, using them topically. Um, but I'm also gonna go over the, the basics, so to speak, about the um, other B vitamins and why they're important, very important in fact, critical to our overall health and, and the uh, normal functioning of our bodies, which of course includes the skin. So let me know um, what questions you may have along the way and we'll get to those um, after we go through the topic and get my notes going. Tomorrow, just a bit of personal news. Um, tomorrow is my son's eighth birthday. I, I don't know where the time has gone. Um, every year has been different, of course, you know, when you're raising a, a tiny human from infancy through childhood. And I am, um, I'm exceptionally proud of him. He's just such a great kid. Um, he's even tempered. He is, um, he's kind to people. Um, he has uh, a really uh, fascinating imagination, you know, and, and uh, you know, eight year olds, you know, they're definitely taking an understanding more about the world around them and, and starting that whole process of you know, more intense reasoning and rationalization. And um, he's not afraid to tell us how he would do things differently. Or when we explain to him, well, this is how this whatever works, or this is why this is this way. Um, you know, he'll, he'll ask intelligent questions. So um, let me make sure that wasn't, uh, there we go. Okay. So it's just been it's just been amazing. <clears throat> We're looking forward to celebrating his birthday with family and friends tomorrow, including uh, some <clears throat> uh, very close friends that we consider family that are coming in from out of town. And uh, if if things hold up, they'll they'll miss that terrible ice storm that is heading our way. Um, yeah, I'm kind of like thinking maybe tomorrow might be a work day without any. Um, access to <laughs> electricity, but fingers crossed that won't happen. So let's start, um, I kind of call this invasion of the B vitamins. So going, uh, starting with the basics, there are eight B vitamins and they're sometimes referred to, like you'll see this on supplements as B complex, um, because all of them in various dosages, uh, whether you get it from supplements or from food sources, they all play uh, vital roles in the body. All of them are also water soluble vitamins, which means that the body doesn't store them for future use. So when you're consuming B vitamins, whether it's in uh, foods that are natural sources of them, whether it's fortified foods where the B vitamins have been added for extra nutritional value, or whether you are taking your Flintstones multivitamin that has this full suite of B vitamins, you need to replenish them daily because uh, the body doesn't store them, you will pee them out. Essentially, the body takes what it needs in the moment uh, or for the day, if you will, and, and it eliminates the rest. So uh, unlike the fat soluble vitamins, which are A, <clears throat> D, E, and K, um, those are the ones you need to be a little bit more careful with because of the fact that they are stored in the body in the fatty tissue and uh, it's, it's easier to overdo it with those vitamins. 
So what does vitamin D, not vitamin D, what do the various forms of vitamin B do in the body? And I think the better question is what don't they do? Um, one of the major things that they do is they act as coenzymes in several processes that support every aspect of cellular physiologic functioning, including major functions within the brain and, and throughout the body uh, supporting the nervous system. The, the B vitamins uh, as a whole, some, some to varying degrees, different than others, but they assist with what's called catabolic metabolism. Uh, that is a, uh, that essentially leads to energy production. So think of the digestive system. You, you take in, you know, you can't rub a piece of um, broccoli on your stomach and get its nutrients. You would probably just make a mess. <laughs> but when you eat the broccoli through catabolic metabolism that occurs in the digestive process, the, the broccoli is broken down, its nutrients are made available, and uh, it is converted into uh, energy, typically glucose, that the body can put to immediate use. Um, the opposite of catabolic metabolism, or breaking something down, uh, is anabolic metabolism. And that is another area where B vitamins play a critical role. The uh, process of anabolic metabolism results in uh, the bioactive molecules being created that assist in growth and building. So anabolic metabolism is a process where you have several smaller molecules coming together to make something that is uh, larger than the sum of its parts or greater than the sum of its parts and just in general more, more organized. B vitamins are critical cofactors. Um, this goes back to the nervous system for what's called axonal transport. And I had to actually double check what the heck that was. It essentially refers to uh, a series of motor proteins that literally deliver payloads to various cells. So they're, they're like the, 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 the food delivery trucks going around to the cells, cells being restaurants and saying, okay, here's your supply of bread. Here's your supply of meat. Here are the vegetables. Now do something with this, make a meal. <laughs> um, they also uh, are involved in the synthesis of neurotransmitters and many cellular metabolic pathways. B vitamins are also cofactors for many essential enzymes involved in the production of definitely what we would consider more complex molecules such as RNA and DNA. They do occur naturally, uh, primarily in animal and marine fish proteins, dairy products, eggs, uh, leafy green vegetables can be good sources, mushrooms, almonds, uh, beans. Uh, some of the B vitamins occur naturally in soy products, uh, but they're also added to many types of grain-based foods such as pastas and various breakfast cereals. Uh, oh, I thought this was interesting. In my research for this show, I was not aware that certain medications, uh, such as those a uh, person may take to control epilepsy, various immunosuppressants, as well as the tetracycline family of antibiotics, can e either interfere with the absorption or enhance the elimination of B vitamins, which means that it uh, basically gets rid of them uh, faster before they have enough time to work their magic in the body. So always ask your doctor or pharmacist if the medications you take require you to be on a specific B vitamin or a B vitamin complex. Um, the tricky thing about becoming deficient in some of the B vitamins is that you can be deficient in them for months and months before you really start noticing that something's off. Um, the, the good news is that as soon as that deficiency is discovered, um, by upping your intake of that specific B vitamin or group of B vitamins, uh, the, the symptoms of the deficiency reverse. Um, there's very rare occasion where the symptoms of vitamin D or why do I keep saying that? Vitamin B deficiency are irreversible. Uh, oh, another thing I found out was that, um, um, OTC antacid medications, Prilosec being a brand name example, uh, can also interfere with the absorption of vitamin B12. So if you routinely use antacid medications, I'm not talking about popping the occasional Tums, but if you're on a over-the-counter uh, medication for heartburn, for example, if it's chronic for you without that medication, 
definitely talk to your healthcare provider about vitamin B12 supplement uh, or and or ask for a vitamin B12 blood test. There are pretty much tests for all of the vitamin uh, Bs in terms of being able to determine your level of them, although some of them are a bit more suspect in terms of do the results really tell you what the active level is or are they just recording that level in the moment and kind of lumping everything together. Kind of like uh, with a testosterone test, you, you'll get a reading for what's called free testosterone, which is the metabolically active form. And then uh, it'll also include what's called bound testosterone, which means the testosterone is wrapped in protein and it's essentially just hanging out. It's not really doing anything one way or the other, but it contributes to your uh, total testosterone number. Um, but the free testosterone number was really what you'd want to Particularly if you're a male and you're concerned about having low T and the symptoms that can cause, you, you want to make sure your free testosterone is, is where it should be. So looking at the, the B vitamins one by one, thankfully they are, they are numbered. And for some reason, I was wondering about this. There isn't a B8. We start at B1 and then it's B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They skip 8. And then they go, but the next one is, is B9. So we're going to go over um, all of those so you have a better understanding of them. And of course, I will be calling out where, uh, where the B vitamin is of particular benefit to skin when you are using it uh, via skincare products. Vitamin B1 is also known as thiamine. And an eternal, internal deficiency uh, of this vitamin is, is very serious. Thankfully, it's also very rare, uh, but it can lead to brain damage due to premature death of neurons, which are the signaling pathways in the brain. If, if your neurons aren't firing properly, your brain is not functioning uh, at, its, at its normal level. Um, a, a thiamine deficiency is most often seen in people who have chronic alcoholism. Uh, and it can also sometimes be seen in people that have um, untreated eating disorders, uh, the type where uh, anorexia, for example, where they are taking in um, <clears throat> minimal nutrients, very few calories, uh, and often taking steps to <clears throat> let that food pass through the system as soon as possible. <clears throat> So that is something uh, to keep in mind in terms of <clears throat> deficiency issues. Thiamine um, may have antioxidant ability, but this hasn't been shown to be true with topical use. That's one of the reasons if you read about thiamine in our cosmetic ingredient dictionary at paulischoice.com, uh, we rate uh, thiamine uh, vitamin B1 as average. There, there just isn't much out there in terms of topical benefit. Um, but of course, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that thiamine isn't contributing to the health of our skin when it's consumed as part of a diet, whether through food or supplements. It's antioxidant, it does have antioxidant action in the body, but the, the, the thinking is that this stems from the byproducts that result from the internal metabolism of this vitamin, so something that doesn't happen on the skin. Uh, thiamine also plays a role in the body, again, not through topical use, but in the body it plays an important role in the granulation process of collagen. So it's in the body helping, uh, it's sort of at the, the, the germination and the, the early um, building process of collagen before it's fully formed. But as you can imagine, without it, uh, if it's a necessary component of that process, you're going to start seeing the body won't be able to make uh, normal collagens. Vitamin B2 is also known as riboflavin, uh, and it's an, it is an essential synthesizing uh, vitamin for niacin, for uh, which is another B vitamin, number three, folic acid, which is, um, uh, I believe that one is B9, and then vitamin B6, uh, as well as all Heme, H-E-M-E, -E, which are iron, heme refers to iron. Uh, it is essential for synthesizing iron-containing proteins. And why are those important? Well, they transport oxygen throughout the body. So you kind of want those uh, floating around. Uh, riboflavin is also needed for metabolizing uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, all of those into glucose, which is the sugar that the body uses and, and the brain uses a ton of it for fuel. 
The antioxidant effect of riboflavin uh, is vital to cellular respiration and function in the immune system, but research has not shown that topical uh, riboflavin offers critical benefits, especially compared with other antioxidants. So certainly is not a wasted ingredient to see in skincare products, but uh, if you are uh, looking for more potent antioxidants for skin, that, that would not even make my top 50. Um, although it's not considered an antioxidant for skin in the conventional sense, as in like scavenging those free radical, uh, the various free radicals, of the, the various um, ROS, the reactive oxygen species, topical riboflavin has been shown to bolster skin's immune system after exposure to UV radiation. So essentially, just like niacinamide, it helps restore vital reparative energy that UV exposure impairs. Um, <clears throat> various uh, forms of energy in the body, such as ad adenosine <coughs> triphosphate, depend on B vitamins serving as cofactors to keep that energy production up. UV light exposure can hinder the production and the performance of those energy molecules. It essentially uh, breaks them down prematurely. Uh, and so topical application of riboflavin and niacinamide has been shown to get that those levels, <clears throat> I don't know if I would say back up exactly to where they were before the damage occurred, but it, they definitely have a, a reparative role. Uh, this is also important to know, riboflavin also plays a role in protecting the retina of the eye, which is very essential to have normal vision throughout your life. Uh, next up is vitamin B3. It almost needs no introduction. On um, supplements, vitamin labels, uh, and you're looking at the nutrition facts on your box of cereal, you're going to see vitamin B3 listed as niacin. So what's the difference between niacin and niacinamide, which is what we know of for skincare? And niacinamide is the biologically active amide form of niacin. And an amide is a chemical compound that contains what's called a carbonyl group or carbon and oxygen that is linked to a nitrogen atom. So this does give niacinamide a different molecular uh, structure, uh, as well as some differing functions to niacinamide. Uh, it does many things for skin uh, when applied topically, several of which I've talked about before. So this is going to be a brief rundown, really more for the newbies who are watching this. Um, niacinamide has uh, an ability, they're not quite exactly sure how this works, but we know from uh, research that it, uh, comparative research that it certainly makes a difference in minimizing the appearance of enlarged pores, as well as improving uh, what some people, myself included, refer to as um, orange peel textured skin. That is essentially what happens when <clears throat> the pores are not only a bit enlarged, perhaps because they're clogged deeper down, but as we age, as we accumulate more sun damage, if we haven't been good about sun protection over the years, the underlying uh, support structure of our skin can start to break down cross-link and eventually atrophy. It, it, that's you know a big a big cause of, of sagging, particularly on the face. As that structure breaks down, the normally uh, round and more pinpoint size of, of, of individual pore takes on uh, a, a drooping, almost like a teardrop shape instead of being a, a baseball shape. Uh, and that can, when that happens to a larger area of skin, it can create what people refer to as an orange peel texture. So niacinamide, particularly in higher concentrations, can really help to uh, repair some of that and restore a more uh, youthful, a more normal looking skin texture. <clears throat> it also restores skin's defenses against moisture loss and dehydration. Uh, primarily does this um, not only by helping to, to prevent water loss, but through the upregulation of ceramide synthesis within the skin. Uh, we know from several different studies, niacinamide can help with uh, evening out skin tone and uh, fading discolorations uh, from past sun damage. It definitely impacts as an antioxidant. It can reduce the impact of environmental damage on skin. Uh, and that's also partly due to its ability to improve skin's barrier. Plus it plays a role in helping skin repair past signs of damage. 
part of that is due to its natural soothing properties because when you've got the inflammation occurring deeper in the skin from the environmental damage, skin does its best to um, ameliorate or attenuate or reduce that to the extent possible. But if, um, if what is causing that inflammation isn't uh, reduced or, or stopped, uh, so think of, of tanning. Tanning is, is definitely inflammatory. Uh, every time you're in the sun without protection, you're generating inflammatory molecules and uh, upregulating those inflammatory pathways in skin. Um, and then your, your skin, to, it has certain systems in place primarily its own antioxidant enzyme network that helps to minimize that as much as possible. But if the damage continues without any sort of avoidance or protection, eventually those systems in your skin become exhausted. They, they can't do their jobs as well anymore. There aren't enough of those substances to keep up. So uh, niacinamide can step in and help shore up those, those systems. Uh, however, it is not you know, using niacinamide, you've got a free pass to go out and keep up that inflammatory damage, you know, whether it's from uh, a nutrient poor diet, whether it's from tanning, whether it's from smoking, uh, you definitely need to make those necessary lifestyle changes if your goal is having a healthier, younger looking skin as long as possible. Um, what else about niacinamide? Oh, uh, this is a lesser known fact. Niacinamide can improve sebum texture and quality, and that's one of the ways it's thought to reduce enlarged pores because as that sebum uh, that is lower quality, so to speak, uh, becomes thicker, uh, it's not flowing as smoothly, uh, that is what is causing, uh, part of what is causing that backup in the pore. Uh, the sebum is not able to make it all the way to the surface. It is mixing with uh, dead skin cells in the pore lining that would normally shed and the sebum would carry it to the surface and they, you know, fall off invisibly. Uh, it's getting mixed in with those and with tiny hairs that line the pore, pore lining and just like the hairs on our head and other parts of our body go through a, a growth stage, a shedding phase, and a resting phase, the same process is happening in the pore lining and those tiny hairs make their way out. But if they don't, they can contribute to the clogs. Niacinamide has also been shown uh, in, I believe this is in vitro, so in a lab setting research, to protect living skin cells known as keratinocytes from the damaging effects of UVB light. So that does not mean that niacinamide is a replacement for uh, UV filters <clears throat> that you'd find in a, a SPF rated sunscreen. But it does mean that niacinamide can be a great ingredient to incorporate into your morning and or evening routines to really put skin in the best possible position. Uh, vitamin C plays this role as well to defend itself and help repair to the extent possible the visible signs of environmental damage. Got all my beverages here. Um, the nicotinamide form uh, is preferred that nicotinamide is an alternate or a name for niacinamide. The two are interchangeable, uh, but the, the, that form of niacin is preferred for the skin because it does not cause the flushing, the itching, or the burning sensation uh, that occurs due to high amounts of what, free niacin. So it's the, the niacin molecule that can cause that, and that's sometimes why you may have come across um, an article or <clears throat> maybe even a derm blog where they advise uh, people with rosacea from using niacinamide because of the concern over free niacin. I can't speak for what every other brand who uses niacinamide in skincare is doing. I don't have access to the exact uh, data on their niacinamide. Um, because it can vary from supplier to supplier, but Paula's Choice in all of our niacinamide products, uh, we use the USP grade, which has uh, a vanishingly low, and by that I mean virtually undetectable, level of free niacin. So it is, uh, as far as I understand, it's impossible to eliminate the presence of that 100%, but you can get it down so low that it's inconsequential. You, meaning even if you do have extra sensitive skin or rosacea, that you can certainly try one of our niacinamide products and, and see how it does for you. Um, given 
the uh, yep. finicky nature of rosacea skin. That is not, you know, it, you, niacin may, may not be for you, but I wouldn't, uh, it, it has so many benefits for skin. I wouldn't shy away from it out of concern about niacinamide worsening the flushing that accompanies rosacea as one of its visible symptoms. So that's what I'm getting at. Next up uh, is vitamin B5, which is also known as uh, pantothenic acid or panthenol is what you may see on a cosmetic ingredient label. Um, <clears throat> next to niacinamide, panthenol for certain has the most research pertaining to its benefits for skin. Pantothenic acid is found in small amounts in nearly all foods with particularly high amounts found uh, in grains, in organ meats, and in egg yolk. Uh, it's essential in the biosynthesis of coenzyme A, which is a critical cofactor in fatty acid metabolism. Uh, it's also critical in the biosynthesis of cholesterol, other fatty acids, as well as the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which has a direct impact on muscle movement or muscle contraction. You want acetylcholine doing its thing, um, except for controlled situations uh, such as wrinkles. Uh, that is one of the ways that Botox injections work is that they, they block that action of a very specific muscle or part of the muscle that is uh, when it contracts and releases repetitively, it eventually leads to the formation of expression lines. Panthenol is the stable and biologically active form of pantothenic acid, and it's vital for the release of energy from food as well as for healthy growth and for the production of antibodies that assist our immune system in keeping us healthy. Uh, it requires vitamin A, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, vitamin B9, and vitamin B3 in order to function properly. So this is a good example of a B vitamin that need in the body, this is not true for the skin, in the body that needs other vitamins uh, to be its friends and unlock its full potential. Pantothenic acid is also essential for the normal growth and maintenance of skin and hair. Uh, probably the strongest association between those parts of the body is found with panthenol. So in skincare products, it has humectant or moisture water attracting properties that help keep skin moist and supple. It can also stimulate repair. It can inhibit uh, signs of sensitivity such as redness or other signs of irritation. It also makes dry skin softer and more elastic and soothes irritated skin. Plus panthenol can help heal minor wounds. So think of like nicks from shaving or like minor scrapes on the skin. You might brush against something that's a little bit rough. It's not a, a true, you haven't cut your skin, but you can tell that it's damaged. Panthenol, and now the research looked at amounts of panthenol uh, between three and 5%, <clears throat> with a 5% concentration being considered ideal. The use of uh, panthenol as a moisturizer and conditioner and hair care products, probably made most famous by uh, Pantene and their Pro Vitamin B5 ad, uh, they're using panthenol. Basically what panthenol does to hair is it gives it, uh, it moisturizes, it helps improve manageability, helps protect and repair damage due to chemical and mechanical procedures. So brushing, combing, shampooing, dyeing your hair. Uh, panthenol has also been shown to reduce the formation of split ends, improve the condition of damaged hair, help to thicken the hair, as well as in part shine to the hair. Uh, and interestingly, we used to think that panthenol being water soluble, um, you know, you're using it in a shampoo, you're using it in a conditioner, and you're, and you're rinsing those products from the hair. Uh, but it turns, so basically the thought process was that panthenol is just going right down the drain along with the surfactants and, and the other water soluble ingredients. But it turns out that panthenol, if left on long enough, was good, which can just be like two, three minutes. So I think there, because of this, panthenol has more utility or usefulness in a conditioner over a shampoo, but it actually does get deposited in, on the hair and can penetrate the hair shaft. So subsequent use of panthenol, uh, studies have looked at what happens, what changes happen to the hair shaft after a couple of uses of a panthenol product, and then after say two weeks of use of a panthenol containing product. And these were studies designed where panthenol was the leading 
active ingredient. They, it wasn't, so in other words, when they were looking at the results of the hair shaft under a microscope, they weren't uh, looking at a formula that had several emollients, silicones, oils, or any other ingredient that is was known ahead of time to be able to have that effect on the hair. That's important because they were able to isolate, yes, this is what happens when you use panthenol in hair products repeatedly as opposed to just once or twice. So pretty cool ingredient. Um, uh, panthenol is one of the leading ingredients in our 5% niacinamide body serum. So we took the two most currently most exciting B vitamin ingredients for skin and wrapped them up into this gorgeous serum. Um, I, I, I'm sign, sounding a bit... Uh, salesy there and I don't mean to but I just love that body serum oh my gosh I think I think I, I think by now I'm on my ninth bottle but uh, and I I, um, I get what some people refer to as strawberry legs where around the base of the hair follicle uh, you can see like a pink or red dot and y'all can see how white I am so imagine how that looks um, and I've noticed that ongoing use of that body serum basically keeps that away because uh, that can be a sign of irritation or inflammation. Uh, so I love it for that. And I also find that it, um, I don't necessarily need to use another body moisturizer on top of it. Um, however, if my skin is experiencing a more pronounced spot of dryness, I probably would. Um, but for the most part, I just apply that on its own, uh, mostly to my legs. And I also will use it on my forearms because my forearms have definitely gotten more sun damage and I haven't been as good over the years about keeping that either covered or protected. Uh, and I've noticed some wonderful, what I would call skin tone uniformity improvements on my arms as well as fading of hyperpigmentation. So next up, getting through these vitamins, so much to say. Vitamin B6, which is also known as peroxidine, uh, this is another one that we rated average in our Cosmetic Ingredient Dictionary due to the kind of underwhelming amount of research as it pertains to topical use. But in terms of what it does in the body, peroxidine's active form is known as peroxidol 5-phosphate, and that is a coenzyme that supports more than 100 other enzymes in performing various functions, including the maintenance of normal levels of the amino acid derivative known as homocysteine. That is important because high levels of homocysteine present many health risks. It, uh, when you get too much homocysteine, it can cause widespread systemic inflammation uh, and it can lead to, uh, among other health issues, heart attacks and stroke. Uh, so this vitamin B6 also plays a role in supporting immune function and brain health and the breakdown of various carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Because it's so essential, Vitamin B6, this is interesting, it's so essential in serotonin and dopamine synthesis that observational studies have shown some evidence that it can be a helpful adjunct or add-on to treating uh, uh, depression, uh, aggressive behavior, and migraine headaches. Pretty cool. And how easy is it to either make sure you're getting enough vitamin B6 in your diet, uh, and if you're not, start eating more of those foods uh, and or start taking a supplement, you may feel less depressed. I, worth trying. Uh, topical use of vitamin B6 has been shown to, uh, like niacinamide, to help suppress UVB-induced damage to skin. Um, but unlike niacinamide being able to do that all on its own, the, the only study I found that showed evidence of this was when the peroxidine, that vitamin B6, was combined with the amino acid serine. And it works in a very distinctive way by quenching free iron that, uh, let, me, let me back that up. It quenches excess free iron that forms in skin as a result of UV exposure. Uh, remember, even when you're wearing sunscreen, because no sunscreen is 100% effective, there's always some amount of UV light that gets through. As I've said many times, the tiny amount that gets through is a heck of a lot better than letting everything through, um, hence the need for sunscreen. But uh, this free iron that is generated by UV light would otherwise go on to cause 
uh, oxidative damage within the skin. So that helps the, the peroxidine with the serine seems to keep that in check. But otherwise topical use really has limited it, uh, applications. Uh, there's certain rare health issues where it may play a role uh, and it, can, it may also boost the efficacy of oil reducing products. So that tells me it may potentially, this hasn't been fully uh, explained yet, but it may have a sebum thinning role similar to what niacinamide does. And it does seem to have a uh, cofactor role in uh, anti-dandruff shampoos. So it, it, that tells me that it may, there may be some synergy between vitamin B6 and the typical antifungal ingredients like zinc pyrithione that are found in dandruff shampoos. Uh, so if you do see uh, peroxidine or vitamin B6 on a dandruff shampoo or conditioner label, well, it may not be a throwaway ingredient there. Next up is vitamin B7, which is also known as biotin. It plays an essential role in uh, gene regulation. Again, this is in the body. Cell signaling as well as cell replication in terms of uh, helping the cell know how often to replicate before it uh, goes through what's called cell death or apoptosis. It catalyzes the metabolism of fatty acids as well as glucose and amino acids. So it helps uh, break those down. Uh, amino acids can be broken down into smaller peptides. Biotin deficiency uh, definitely is associated with hair thinning. Uh, can also You may also see a scaly rash around your nose, uh, eyes, and mouth. You may also see if you're deficient in biot biotin nail changes, such as thinner nails, more ridging, or your nails uh, are breaking more easily. Uh, biotin deficiency can also cause skin infection as well as neurologic symptoms, but deficiencies, true deficiencies in biotin are considered rare. So I wanted to read to you uh, the closing passage from an extensive overview of uh, multiple studies looking at biotin supplementation to help with hair loss uh, and um, nail health. Uh, and it says, though its use as a hair and nail growth supplement is prevalent, research demonstrating the efficacy of biotin for these concerns is limited. In cases of acquired or inherited causes of biotin deficiency, as well as pathologies such as brittle nail sy syndrome or uncombable hair, that's actually a thing, <laughs> biotin supplementation may be a benefit. However, we propose these cases are uncommon and that there is a lack of sufficient evidence for supplementation in otherwise healthy individuals. So. You can be a perfectly healthy person and be experiencing male pattern baldness or female pattern baldness through various other hormonal changes in the body that are considered perfectly normal. Uh, don't bother taking biotin. Chances are you're not deficient in it. If you want to be extra sure, ask your doctor to order a blood test because again, that, that'll tell you right then and there if you truly are deficient in it. Because if you're not, then taking a supplement and, and hoping you know, that it's gonna help stop your hair breakage or your thinning. I just don't want, I don't want you to waste your money and your time when there are other effective methods, both over the counter and prescription to discuss with your doctor that uh, you can use to tackle that concern. Lastly, vitamin B9. This is a big one. Um, more, it's, it's also known as folate or folic acid. Um, not necessarily a major, major B vitamin to use topically. However, uh, it is definitely a can't miss, must have B vitamin in terms of overall health. So folate is the general term to describe the various forms of folic acid. There's several of them. And these are all crucial for nucleic acid synthesis uh, as well as for red blood cell production. So folic acid is involved in converting that homocysteine I mentioned a moment ago to methionine, which is essential for a process called hematopoiesis. That is a very fancy medical word for blood cell production. Uh, so, and not surprisingly, uh, folic acid definitely plays a starring role in helping to prevent anemia, which is, there's various types of anemia, the most common being um, uh, low levels or uh, low levels of iron in 
the blood. You may uh, have heard it described as iron poor blood. Um, you do not need, uh, regardless of gender, you do not need much iron uh, to be to be healthy. Um, women tend who are in their menstrual years tend to lose iron uh, when they're experiencing their cycle. Uh, however, most people eat enough iron from foods. There is a concern if you follow a vegan diet that you may not be getting enough iron. The iron found in plants is not considered as, as bioavailable as the iron found in, say, a steak or other types of animal protein. So, a deficiency in folic acid is kind of a big deal because it can give rise to uh, not only that increase in homocysteine, which causes system-wide inflammation, uh, but it can cause other issues too. And certain groups of people are more likely to have inadequate folate intake and deficiency. Uh, and this includes women of childbearing age as well as black women. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why, uh, why those two groups are disproportionately affected, I would need to do uh, a deeper dive there. But generally, the recommended dietary intake is specifically increased um, for uh, those groups of people, uh, particularly when you know that you're pregnant uh, or when you're lactating, because maternal uh, low, level, low levels of folate during a pregnancy increase the chance of congenital birth defects. Uh, that can include um, neural tube defects, so birth defects that impact the brain as it's developing, as well as um, increase the risk of uh, having a baby born with a congenital heart defect. It can also lead to low birth weight, premature labor, as well as delayed fetal growth, meaning that you know, you're eight months along and, and the fetus isn't where it should be based on that time period. There's, there's developmental delays happening. Um, topically, folic acid does work with creatine uh, to boost skin's firmness by increasing the density of collagen fibers and, and, well, and it also uh, plays a role in reducing age-related collagen decline. Uh, as we get older, Separate from what happens due to environmental damage, our bodies become less and less efficient at making high quality collagen. So they may still, this is one of the reasons why someone in their uh, 60s and 70s, for example, when they get a wound, the, the healing time is, is slower. That, that, that knitting back to, together, which involves collagen, wound healing collagen, uh, is just not as efficient as it was when that same person was in their 20s and 30s. So their wounds literally take longer to heal than someone younger. Uh, and that's just a fact of life. It's not, you know, necessarily tied to making bad decisions when you were younger or not eating this or whatever. But folic acid absolutely plays a role in that. Last but not least is the uh, uh, vitamin B12 which is also no known as coba lamin. In the body, uh, B12 is required for red blood cell production, neurologic function, and myelin or nerve fiber sheath synthesis. So what, what coats the nerve so that when it runs into or, or touches other nerves, you're not getting crosstalk that can result in something, uh, a sensation, for example, that you're not supposed to be feeling as a result of how the nerves are interacting. The uh, vitamin B12 also serves as a cofactor in DNA and RNA synthesis, as well as the synthesis of several different types of uh, hormones. It plays a role in lipid metabolism, as well as lipid synthesis, or the creation of uh, li lipids, as well as certain proteins. So vitamin B12, it, it's one of the B vitamins that is doing a lot in the, it's very busy in the body. It has many, many, wears many different hats. Uh, topically, this was interesting, um, I, vi vitamin B12 is up and coming. I think in the next two to five years, we'll likely start seeing more and more skincare products that contain vitamin B12, uh, and it may end up eventually rivaling niacinamide for its long and varied list of benefits for skin. So far, research has revealed that B12 can help promote a stronger, healthier barrier like niacinamide does. They actually, uh, I found a relatively recent comparative study uh, on people with atopic dermatitis where uh, it was a, a um, one group got 
petrolatum, standard emollient, Vaseline, to help with signs and symptoms of atopic dermatitis. And the other group got um, vitamin B12 in a bland cream base. And the group that got the vitamin B12 actually had uh, a uh, stronger barrier and as a result, their skin became more resistant to future signs uh, and symptoms such as itching of atopic dermatitis. It also may protect against atopic dermatitis flares and help prevent other inflammatory skin disorders. And this is because it can topically scavenge the neurotransmitter nitric oxide, which plays a role in fueling itching and redness because it upregulate something in skin that researchers have termed substance P. And that is the main neuropeptide found in nerve cells connected to skin. So this excess nitric oxide is believed to play a role uh, in uh, inflammatory skin disorders, the two most common being psoriasis and eczema. So if you are struggling with either of those, look into vitamin B12, both topically uh, and as a supplement, talk to your doctor about getting your blood levels checked. If you're low, even just a little bit low in vitamin B12, and some people have certain uh, underlying disorders. My mother is one of them. My mother found out uh, before she got pregnant with me because she, she was not. My parents got married five years before I was born, and, and they got married in the late 60s, which was definitely an era where... Um, you were especially they were catholic uh they are catholic uh where you were expected to start a family right away and my mother wanted kids right away but it wasn't happening and it wasn't happening and she eventually found out that she has a condition called pernicious anemia where her body is unable to absorb b12 from foods or from supplements so she was definitely deficient in that and her doctor suspects that is one major reason why she was not getting pregnant. Uh, the body knew, her body knew it couldn't sustain a pregnancy without that critical nutrient. Um, so she started getting monthly, uh, probably more frequently originally, but B12 shots, uh, where you, you essentially get a mega dose of vitamin B12 and, and literally within like six weeks of that, she got pregnant. And that was me. So yay for vitamin B12. <laughs> um, vitamin B12 has a natural pink color. Uh, so it lends a what many people would consider an attractive color to skincare formulas. Uh, it may play a role, uh, a very soothing role in skin. So you may start seeing it in products designed for sensitive skin. From a formulary perspective, uh, we know that it is uh, a stable ingredient in weak acid formulas which is great because those weak acid formulas, like a pH of between four and six, right in the range of what you want for skin in terms of compatibility. It is not as stable though when your formula has a strong acid like a pH two or a strong base or alkalinity such as pH above nine. Um, it is water soluble. So because of that, like other B vitamins, the best penetration is going to be achieved for skin when it is combined with uh, lipids or fats in a formula. So a triglyceride, an oil, uh, cholesterol, ceramides, it needs those ingredients to be in the formula. Uh, or there, you can also get those ingredients from other products that you would layer with that. And the recommended usage level in skincare at this time of vitamin B12 is between half percent and three percent. Um, along with the uh, anemia uh, condition I mentioned, deficiencies in vitamin B12 can uh, trigger hyperpigmentation. So if you are experiencing that, especially in areas of your body that uh, aren't typically exposed to the sun, if you are noticing hair and nail changes, uh, fatigue, loss of appetite, um, because the best sources, food sources of vitamin B12 are animal meats and their byproducts, such as dairy, for example, uh, people following a vegan diet should talk to their physician about taking a vitamin B12 supplement, or at the very least, uh, have ongoing vitamin B12 blood tests to make sure that your levels are where they should be. That's the vitamin D story, people. Um, let's get to your questions in the short amount of time we have left. I did not know that this was going to take up almost the whole hour. 
But I hope you can tell that this um, this was kind of an energizing topic for me. Um, and I'm glad we didn't just talk about niacinamide the whole time because we already know that that's, that's awesome. Jessica says, hi, Brian. I miss BDP reviews and most of Paula's best makeup recommendations in her books are discontinued. Can you share your favorite foundations with mineral SPF? Oh, a foundation. You know, I am, Jessica, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I am definitely out of the loop when it comes to um, the various foundations on the market these days. Um, however, I have found uh, and I've heard from several people that uh, the staff at various Sephora stores um, are really, they, they, they're more uh, well-trained than they ever have been before and truly helping you find a great foundation for your needs. So at this point, my best recommendation would be to visit your local Sephora store, let them know the type of foundation you want. Uh, and then they also have, um, they can also help find your uh, exact matte shade pretty efficiently. And if you think you're between shades or if there's maybe two or three formulas with sunscreen that look exciting, they'll make you samples little samples you can take home and experiment with so you can make sure that you really feel that the foundation is giving you the coverage you want, that the color looks great, even in natural light. Uh, it's working well layering with their other makeup you may use or layering over your skincare. So um, yeah, I think they've got a really great program there and I would encourage you to check it out. And I'm sorry I don't have one off the top of my head to just rattle off to you. Lulu says, hello, hi y'all. Can I use the 10% niacinamide with the discoloration serum in the same routine at night? I do. Uh, yes, since there's 5% in it as well, is there such a thing as too much niacinamide? I mean, niacinamide is pretty harmless. Uh, having said that though, it is a more bioactive ingredient. Uh, the safety assessment for niacinamide uh, looked at concentrations up to 20% and found that even at that level uh, that it wasn't sensitizing, it wasn't irritating, it wasn't mutagenic, uh, there, there were no to uh, toxicity uh, side effects noticed whatsoever up to that level. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I use the discoloration repair serum. I use the 10% niacinamide booster all over and then I put the discoloration repair serum on those areas of concern. It's fine to put that serum all over your face if you want to, and if you're battling multiple discolorations, definitely do that, because otherwise it's just like dot, 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 and it just starts getting silly after a while. Just just put it all over. Um, so yeah, it really, that application method is going to depend on how large your area of concern is. Uh, Jeppe, Jeppe, I'm sorry if I'm not saying that correctly. Hi, Brian, my absolute favorite skincare champ. Has there been any actual clinical studies or noticeable data from the suppliers showing a big difference between using a niacinamide product with around 5% or a product with much higher concentrations like the 20% one? Does it work quicker or better? The only actual authority I've heard talk about the benefit of using such a high percentage has come from Paula herself and her personal experience, but I was wondering if there was any clinical data as well. I know the 5% has been very well tested and studied, but has there been any newer studies looking at the usage into uses at the higher percentage? Whew. Not that I'm aware of. Um, it is the 20% amount that we use in the clinical niacinamide treatment. Um, that was born uh, from the safety assessment that I just discussed because we would never want to use an ingredient on a level that's been proven to be unsafe or a problem for skin. Uh, the 20% concentration came about as an experimental idea on Paula's part. Here was the situation. She had been using the 10% niacinamide booster for quite some time and loving it. But uh, Paula is prone to a condition called sebaceous hyperplasia, which can result in a rough or bumpy texture on the skin. And she had been using the 10% niacinamide booster and felt like her results with that had kind of plateaued. And so she went to the lab. We have, a, we have an in-house lab and a team of chemists uh, at our Seattle office and said, I'm curious, what a 20% concentration of niacinamide may do for my skin 
Uh, and she was also struggling with, like, as I mentioned earlier uh, this hour, that orange peel texture that happens uh, with a, that loss, that laxity that can set in. So the lab essentially took the chassis for the 10% niacinamide booster, up the concentration of niacinamide, found that they needed to uh, add some more solubilizers to keep it suspended in the formula, gave it to Paula, said, here, give this a try, let us know what you think. And lo and behold, Paula, she saw great results with it. And then, uh, not we wouldn't ever launch a product just because one person, whether it's Paula or me or you know the new, the new employee in customer service had a great experience with it. We uh, made a larger batch and then started testing it in-house and that went well. And then we made a larger batch and did <clears throat> our full-scale external panel test, which <clears throat> I believe at the time probably included about 60 people, maybe more, maybe 100. And then their feedback was overwhelmingly positive as well. And that's when we knew we were onto something and that there was a place in the line for a stronger niacinamide product. So if you're using the 10% <clears throat> booster like I am and you're seeing great results, do you need that 20%? Probably not, probably not. But for, the, for those people out there that have <clears throat> um, more advanced concerns, particularly related to uh, the orange peel texture, the poor laxity, uh, the, the, the bumpy flesh colored bumps, um, not milia, that's a different concern. Uh, the 20% niacinamide could produce some nice visible benefits. Uh, and it's certainly, you know, it, it's not going to be a problem uh, for, for most people's skin in terms, I, I, I don't, I think we've had a very low return rate on that product due to a sensitized response. Um, but yes, uh, in truth, there isn't, I have, and I have seen no new research that a, there, I have not seen any comparative studies that here's 5%, here's what we got in terms of hyperpigmentation, here's 20%, and wow, look at the difference. That research, to the best of my knowledge, does not exist. Uh, maybe it's being done, uh, but it hasn't been published yet. Um, sometimes, though, the decisions we make around formulas are based on what we know to be true, our, our current knowledge of a given ingredient or blend of ingredients. And then we uh, basically say, well, what would happen if we did this? And we check for things like safety and you know the toxicologic profile and all that. And that can be a great jumping off point for a new formula. And uh, our, our niacinamide at 20% is definitely innovative and it does, it's made a lot of people happy. So um, I, I think it's kind of a, it's a departure of sorts from the way we normally approach uh, product development and formula development, but it worked. And it's, you know, it's to this day, Paula is still using that product. <clears throat> Daniel, hi Brian, I hope you are well. This topical application of niacinamide stimulate collagen production. <clears throat> what concentration should I look for? Ooh, Daniel, that's a good question. My, off the top of my head, without taking a few minutes to double check the research, is that it isn't necessarily a stimulator of collagen, but it plays more of a role in helping to uh, repair existing collagen that has become fragmented or otherwise damaged due to environmental exposure. So I'm certain it does that. I don't know with 100% certainty in the moment if it actually plays a role in creating new collagen as well. It might. <clears throat> okay, one more question here. Um, Christine, hi Brian, I know it's not on topic. Well, that's fine. But I'm wondering if you could comment on growth factors. Do they work? <clears throat> Are they shelf stable and able to penetrate into skin? Any plans for a growth factor product? Of course, I had to pick the most complicated question to close out the show. Um, Growth factors certainly play a role uh, in, in skin. Keratinocyte growth factor, vascular growth factor, epidermal growth factor. Um, where I think that we don't have such a product um, planned at the moment, 
uh, and I don't know if we ever will. Um, where I see that area becoming more interesting is not in the realm of putting growth factors on the skin. Um, like as in like isolating the pure growth factor or reconstituting epidermal growth factor and then putting that into a cosmetic product, whether it's a toner or moisturizer or serum. And then, you know, here you go. It's probably going to be very expensive. You give me 250 bucks and here's your growth factors. Um, I, I think that there are uh, formulation challenges with that in terms of keeping them active. I think that there are stability challenges with them. Um, there is also a concern uh, that topical usage of growth factors, because within the skin and the body, the uh, growth factors essentially perform as a symphony. Each one, you know, can read the music that the body needs in order to produce the exact right musical passage or note at the exact correct time uh, and, and then let that note sustain itself just as long as it needs in order for that you know decay to happen you know you have a in music you have a you make a sound and then the sound whether it's from a drum or from a trombone or whatever it has a nap there's the creation of the sound and then the sound has a decay as it fades away that's a very good analogy in terms of how the precise mechanism of action and the timing that growth factors have in skin. And I haven't seen really good data that topical use of them has that impact on skin. And if it does, the concern is it won't, the growth factors won't know when to stop. They won't know when to, to be quiet, you know, like quieting the strings so that the woodwinds can play. Uh, and then all of a sudden the strings and the woodwinds know that now is the musical passage, the part of the passage where we, we can both start playing because this is what's needed. That's what the instructions are, you know, but, and by instructions I mean the music that they're following. Uh, it's very much like that in the body and within skin. Um, so where I think the area is going is that we will there there I think we'll see more and more ingredients that are capable of reviving the activity of various growth factors in a uh, syncopated manner growth factors that have whose activity has slowed down with age and as a result of that slowdown um, there are certain um, health related and appearance related qualities of skin that have changed. So I think we'll see some movement in that area where you're, you're looking at ingredients that can help revive the normal syncopated activity of those growth factors within skin. And they'll, and that is a better approach. And I think an overall safer approach than putting pure growth factors in a product. So, on that note, thank you for that question. It, it is a fascinating topic. It's definitely something that I'm personally paying attention to uh, as I get more into uh, longevity science and, and just what the heck is happening to us uh, internally as, as we simply get older. Um, so I appreciate that and thank you all for your questions. And uh, I'm going to sign off. I went a little bit over, but I was also a little bit late in starting. So I will speak with you again next month and come back to our YouTube channel anytime to watch uh, all of the live chats, or at least those are of interest to you. If you like watching my head do this. <laughs> and I will see you next time.